A few days ago, my daughter and I went out and watched the new film Wicked, and we had a good time. Unfortunately, with the price of modern movie tickets, not everyone gets that luxury. So I have taken it upon myself to break down films like this in spoiler fashion so that perhaps one or two people can relive the magic I experienced through the art of storytelling. <laughs> Strap in. It's time to talk about Wicked. Hey, as I'm talking about this movie, if you fancy yourself a little naughty too, maybe hit the subscribe and the notification bell so that future videos by me show up in your feed. Only if you find yourself feeling what I'm putting out. All right, let's get down to business. Jeff Goldblum stars in Wicked, a totally original film that is not based on a play or a book or anything. It is 100% unique, pure, uncut amazement from front to back with nothing to reference along the way. I'm kidding. This is based on Broadway musical. It's based on a book. It of course has very strong ties to the Wizard of Oz classic. But it's also, I think, finding a little room to have some fun along the way. Now, believe it or not, I'm not a Wicked historian. I'm not a connoisseur of the Wicked franchise. I haven't seen the Broadway play, so I'm already, you know, completely useless in the mind of many. So that's okay. That's fine. This is a movie channel. I do movies here. And so I'm taking this from the approach of what I was seeing on the screen play out. All right. So let's, let's walk through this film. We open with a dark, grisly shot of the witch's hat in the puddle of water that she became after the events of the original classic film with Dorothy, the Tin Man, Scare Bitch, all, all the classics that we remember fondly. There's a narration over the top by someone, I already forgot who. The camera pans back. We pull out of the Emerald City Castle and along the yellow brick road where we see our four characters skipping and laughing and loving all the way home. There's girl that wears picnic blanket for a dress. There's fuzzy thing. There's the iron giant. There's scare bitch. And there's courage the cowardly dog. They're all skipping away from the scene of the crime. <laughs> they, they did murder a woman outright. But that's not the story here. The story is gonna take us to Munchkin Land, where we meet the cute, bubbly Glinda, sometimes referred to as Glinda. I don't know the official name, but she was born Glinda, and then she kind of changes, she slides into Glinda later, but we'll get there. This is just off the cuff memory, folks. You might be impressed or you might be incredibly disheartened by my terrible memory. Well, we'll see where we go along the way. It's always a fun journey for everyone. Glinda arrives on a beautiful magical bubble that she takes out with her little wand and she announces to the folk that the wicked witch is dead. <laughs> Boom, 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 boom. The munchkins are over the moon about this news. They're dancing around, they're skipping and laughing and loving, doing a little musical song. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Happy day. Oh, happy day. The witch is dead. Fucking witch. The witch is dead. Bye bye, bitch. That is the song they sing verbatim in my mind. I have no idea. I don't remember almost any of the songs in this film, although they're all pretty solid. They're just not basic enough for someone like me. There's no let it go. There's do you want to build a snowman? We don't have any of that equivalent. Popular, I remember. I remember popular. Anywho, after a skip and a jump, we're off to the races. We're going to go back in time. To the story of a mayor and his wife. The wife is unfaithful. She cheats on this man with a mysterious character who I'm pretty positive based on all the not so subtle hints that it is the Wizard of Oz. Oz himself, and this is important because this woman is gonna give birth to two children, one of which, not really sure it's hers. The baby comes out green. The mayor's thinking this is pretty sus. He looks at his wife, he's like, listen, bitch, I saw the Grinch here two weeks ago. This woman's green, he's green, I'm doing the math. It's not a good situation though. The green She-Hulk they call Elphaba. This is a name they thought was good for some reason. They also have another kid who's of the normal variety called Nesseros. That might not be the right name. I, I'm, I'm looking at IMDb because I forgot them. I'll call her Rose for short. This poor child has an affliction. She's unable to walk. So she's going to be going through life in a wheelchair because the mom drinks some milk flour. 
I think they say offhandedly, like, uh, oh, it's from all that gosh darn milk flour you've been chugging every night before bed. Look what you did to the child, lady. All because you didn't want a green one again. So she's suckling from the teat of the milk flour. <laughs> I don't, that's what the kids are doing these days in Oz. But although the daughter's skin was fair, her legs, they know will work. And so she's going to be bitter. She's going to be jaded towards her sister. Rose is an all around trash person as far as I'm concerned. And it's a shame because Elphaba uh, loves her. She, she does everything for her. And Elphaba is treated like crap, not just from her folks, not just from her sister, but from the little townspeople. They look down on her, they laugh at her, but she is able to hold her own. Through the power of telekinesis, she can make shit move. In one scene early on, the kids are ma making fun of her, kicking dirt, whatnot. She picks up a few rocks, <laughs> Magneto style, and then <laughs> starts chucking rocks at the little shits until they run away. Thanks, bye. We're now gonna fast forward about 15 years. <laughs> And now we are going to the most prestigious school known to man and munchkin kind. It's Shiz University, baby. I know you've been loving this Shiz right here. Shiz is home to all walks of life from all over the world. You got boys, you got girls, you got geese, you got goats, you got green people. Wait, green people? What? <laughs> That's not natural! A giant hippopotamus looks at Elphaba and's like, That's disgusting! Okay, that didn't happen. But there really are talking animals in this world. One of them is a professor. He's a goat. And he's the last teacher there that's an animal who can talk. That's gonna be a subplot in the movie. You know, I like this film, let me reiterate, but man, the stuff I'm saying sounds absolutely stupid. <laughs> so we got a little bit of a Zootopia thing going on here, and for some reason, the girl with the green skin, that's the bridge too far. That's the line that should never be crossed. Now, Elphaba's not even supposed to be there, technically. It's her sister that's going to this school, but that's about to change when crappy Mayor Dad forces Elphaba to keep an eye on her sister, and she wheels her ass around the place, doing a little tour, and we get to see a younger Galinda, played by Ariana Grande, having a devilishly good time. She puts the mean in Mean Girl. She's popular, hot, can sing like no other, and she gives backhanded compliments like it's breathing. And they're so good that most people don't know. It just goes over their heads. But Elphaba knows. You better alphabet your ass she's picking up what she's throwing down. And she's not having it. No siree, Bob. She starts to push back, not just verbally, but physically, with her powers. Benches are lifting into the air. <laughs> it's a spectacle. Thankfully, Madame Morrible was there to see the whole thing, and it's odd that Morrible sounds a lot like horrible. I sure hope this lady doesn't turn out to be bad in the end. She's gonna turn out to be kind of bad in the end. Morrible takes the heat for this and says, hey, class, this is what you can expect from me. I'm awesome, I know how to move things, I know how to shape this world. That's just a taste of what's to come for one or two lucky pupils that I might take under my wing, give them a bit of my tutelage. <laughs> Well, we'll see, not you though, you toodaloo, right? Not tutelage, toodaloo. Toodle bye-bye. Toodle bye-bye. I don't actually know what I'm doing anymore. Uh, but she is gonna take alphabet soup under her wing. And Galinda, being the spoiled little shit that she is, of course, very jelly of the whole situation. I wanna point something else out. This, this movie does, and I don't know if this is what the book or the play does, but I love the little twist on the English language they do from time to time. Galinda's basically the only one that does it. For instance, she'll call her father Popsy or Popsicle, I think. Just fun little naming changes, little tweaks that I like. It reminded me of Amy's character from Futurama. Instead of duh, she would say guh, because they have this inside teen speak. So Elphaba failed up in this instance. She won the hearts and minds of her peers, and she's gonna get put up in this college. She's gonna be able to go here, but she doesn't have a room. Who could she possibly room with? Well, Galinda's got an entire suite all to herself. Looks like the perfect place for a roommate. And that's exactly what it's gonna be. This leads to some of the best scenes in the movie where these two are bouncing dialogue back and forth, fun little physical comedy acts. 
It's good stuff. G-Spot gives Alphabet just a tiny little room in the corner, like a small little nook. And then all of Galinda's stuff is just piled everywhere. It's just absolutely bedlam. This woman is just complete chaos. Alpha's not gonna put up with this crap though. She's like, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry, okay? Don't make me angry, you're not gonna like it. A good third of this movie is really just these two interacting, getting under each other's skin, developing to full bore hatred for each other. This is gonna bring us to the first big subplot, which I imagine is gonna lead to a much bigger storyline in the sequel, which is the professor going through the history lesson of why animals were important and they were on equal footing with the humans and how that has changed over time. Animals have been silenced and they've even lost their ability to speak. Phoebes can relate to the goat, of course, because she's been treated like an animal her whole life, uh, disrespected belittled. So she's going to develop a friendship with this professor, which will lead to some revelations later when she follows the goat back to his little crew, his clubhouse, where he's chatting with a bunny and a few other animals. I think there, I think I spotted a cheetah or a jaguar or something in there. I don't think I'd get too close to that party. We're just a couple dogs in a poker table away from a great painting. She does overhear though how the animals are being silenced and there is a big conspiracy at play. And this is gonna directly correlate with the new cage that has been introduced in class and the disappearance of the goat professor. These animals are being put inside of a new contraption called, as we know, a cage. The world is a vampire. Despite all my rage, I am still just a rat in the cage. That song doesn't play. They don't do a musical rendition of that, but it would have been awesome. This storyline will not get resolved at all because this is a part one film of a two part saga or something. I don't actually know how many parts it's gonna be. Plot point number three is gonna see the good looking heartthrob roll into town. He has enrolled into Shiz University and he's caught the eye of both of our leading ladies. Naturally, he's quite smitten by Galinda right out of the gates, which will lead to another song and dance as we tour around the school, which is very impressively built. I love the look of this. The set design, the clothing, all top notch. They're singing and dancing in the library, which is incredibly rude because as we know, you should not be singing and dancing in a place of peace, in a place of quiet, solitude. How rude. I can't take it with their attitude. Look at these rhymes just coming off the top of my head. Again, in this first section of three, it's really going to be the rivalry between these two ladies, but it's going to eventually form into more of a friendship. And this all culminates in the big ballroom scene where little Linda convinces Alphabet that she should wear this ugly ass witch's hat. She'll be the talk of the town. And so she shows up to the dance looking like a total witch. No one's, no one's feeling it. They all start laughing at her, but Phoebes doesn't care. She pushes through and does an interpretive dance. Who can say whether or not all the day, huh? Only time. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. It's been one week since you looked at me. Down, down out, down, witches down, 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 down. Down, down, down that witch down, is down, 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 down that road, down that fucking road. You can dance if you want to. You can leave this world behind. Gotta make a move to a town that's right for me. Beep beep boop beep boop 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 beep beep boop. Damawani got to Mr. Robot Town. In the town and the teen and the hina, a summer number sign and a ten and a tenner. Huh? Cha-cha real smooth. Now turn it up. Galinda's into it. And eventually they will join forces and dance together. And pretty soon everybody is doing it. It's the huge hit of the summer. It's going down. I'm yelling timber. You better move. You better dance. Their friendship has been forged through dance, the most powerful way you can form a friendship, of course. And this came at a somewhat unopportune time because Elphaba is not thrilled with this whole animal caging situation. And she even goes as far as knocking out the entire classroom, freeing the animal out into the woods. The only person along for the ride is that good looking guy. I think his name is Flero, Flyro. Who the fuck knows? He's the prize at the end of the rainbow, the pot of gold. Possibly just the distraction. While all this has been going on though, 
an important letter has been sent away to none other than Mr. Oz himself, the great wizard in his Emerald Tower off in the distance. And it appears he has gotten this letter. It has been signed, sealed, delivered, and he sends one back their way. Madame Morrible opens up the letter, which gives a golden ticket opportunity for Alphabet to head to the Emerald City to see the man, the myth, the legend himself. But right as she boards the train, she realizes Galinda should probably come with. Because mere minutes ago, Galinda took the courageous act of changing her name from Galinda to Glinda as an act of good faith and remembrance for the professor goat who could never pronounce her name correctly because he's a goat. He would always call her Glinda. And so she did this as a bread breaking gesture of good faith in honor of his name. Was it cringe? Yeah, absolutely was. And I think part of her knows that but everybody else ate it up. Anyways, Alphaba said, screw it, come with me. She does, and they head out of Dodge. They're not in, they're not in Kansas anymore, friends. They're off to see the wizard, the wonderful wizard, and then they get into the town. It's beautiful. It's green, as one would expect. I imagine a couple young kids looking at this and going, oh man, if I had this much emerald in Minecraft, I would have no problems defeating the Ender Dragon. Shut up, little stupid kid. This isn't that. All right, stop with the Minecraft. This isn't that. You have your movie coming out soon. This was a fun and unexpected surprise because I don't follow any of this crap, but we got to see the OG Broadway performers live and in the flesh. Edina Menzel Mamma Mia is here. And her co-star lady that I assume was the original Galinda from the play. I don't have no way of knowing. If only there was some technology that could tell me one way or the other. I'm pretty positive it was. They do a fun reenactment. It's like a play within a play sort of situation. It's very tongue in cheek. And they're fighting along the way, trying to steal each other's performance, trying to upstage the other. Very fun, very clever little part. And then we get another song, another dance. More spectacle. And I'm in, I'm in, I'm loving it. I'm loving every minute of 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 it. After the production, Galinda gets to go in and see Oz. Now the ticket is for her and her alone. Uh, guess we're doing Charlie and the Chocolate Factory rules where she gets to bring a friend along for the journey. So Alphabet brings along Galinda. They go inside. It's a little creepy. It's a little musty in here. Uh, not really what they were expecting. There are monkey guards, which I imagine would throw anyone for a loop. And they escort them back to the great and all-knowing, all-powerful giant head that is the wizard. After a little pageantry, Jeff Goldblum comes out. And he wants to get down to brass tacks pretty early on. He shows them this beautiful vision for the future that has this interconnected road system that he's not sure about the color, but they do land on yellow, which is nice. It's a nice little callback. And he even states that everything he's heard about Alphabet seems to be pretty impressive and he wouldn't mind her staying in the tower right next to him. They can overlook all of Emerald City and beyond together. But she really has to test her might. And it just so happens they have a way to test that out. There's a magical book on a podium off yonder. They open this thing, which is weirdly shaped. I'm not a fan of the look of the book, but it, that's irrelevant. And she has to say the words that are in this ancient language that will make the monkeys fly. It's been a dream of theirs. <laughs> Who hasn't had the dream to fly? Within her is the recipe. The knowledge is baked in and she knows what these magical words are. She says them out loud and we get this grotesque sequence. I mean, grotesque for a PG film where wings are ripping out of the monkey. The guy's like, yeah, so last day tomorrow. Yeah. No, we're going to Red Lobster, me and the missus. It should be a good time. Uh, Jenny's coming in. She's in college right now. Bless her. She's trying. She's in an art program. <laughs> yeah, good luck, Jenny. What are you going to do with that? What kind of salary is that in Emerald City? You're not going to be making any... <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't want... <laughs> not like this. No, like this. And he starts hovering. I hit my light. <laughs> woof, woof. What the fuck? He's in the air flying around and then just collapses, gets bodied. 
just crumples down like a Family Guy animation. Madame Morrible is over the moon about this recent interaction. She can't believe what has taken place. Oz is absolutely thrilled. They can't wait to do more of this crap. But Elphaba is not thrilled. She runs out and sees that all these other poor monkey guards have also been inflicted with this torturous wing apparatus that's taken over their body. She denounces the whole thing. She thinks these people are awful and she has realized that they're the ones behind the silencing of the animals. She is trapped though. Luckily, she's got her best friend, Glinda. Uh, Glinda's kind of like, I don't, this is awkward. Why don't we just stay with them? They're the good guys. This is cool. We're on board still. Okay, I'll come with you. They get inside a hot air balloon as one does. They take to the sky. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on, come on! But the monkeys and the other guards are hot on their trail. It's become quite apparent that uh, Glinda's not on board for this ride. Not in the long haul. This naturally upsets Elphaba, as it would you and I, and we do the same thing that she does, which is bust out into a beautiful song. While she uses one last spell to rise up herself, take flight and get the hell out of there, but it doesn't work. Or does it? She might not have a little spring in her step, but that broomstick does. Oh, look at that, hovering broom. As all witches have, she grabs it, she gives a little tip of the hat, and kaboosh, busts through the glass. <sighs> oh, I probably should have taken a lesson or two. <laughs> yeah! She does a couple twists around the building, flipping people off. How do you like me now? woman. lady. woman. The witchy woman continues to sing. Ariana Grande is trying to upstage her. And just when the movie hits its crescendo, to be continued, slams across the screen, smacks you right across the face. It's over. Two and a half hours go by like that. And now we have to wait for a painful amount of time to get the continuation of this tale. A movie that no one knows how it will end because this is the first time this story has been told across any medium. Uh, but no, I don't actually know where it goes from here and I'm excited to find out. Of, of course, a large amount of people have already watched the story play out on stage or they've read about it so they know where it's gonna go and they might have different expectations they might not like how things played out in the movie. I'm not sure. Let me know in the comments, though. I know I did a bang-up job recreating and uh, collecting all the inner workings of this film, laying it out perfectly and masterfully. But please, let me know your thoughts on this movie, if you've seen it like three times already and you think it's a masterpiece, or if you're like myself and you thought, damn, this was actually a fun time, I could watch it again, and I am actually eager for the next one. Please, again, think of subscribing to the channel, liking the video, sharing it with your mom or dad or, or best friend down the street. Maybe you have a Glinda of your own. You're like, hey, how can I get back at her for all the awful crap she said about me to my face and behind my back? I'll pretend that I'm watching this great channel, have her subscribe to it, and she can be tortured as I have by watching this idiot prattle on about God knows what. And I would appreciate it. If you love what I'm doing, become a patron. At patreon.com slash adamdoesmovies, there's a few different tier levels. With each step you climb, you inch closer to greatness, which is in the form of exclusive content. Movie reviews, vlogs, a show called The Cringe everybody gets access to at $5 a month. It's a beautiful thing. Hopefully I see you both here and there on Patreon in the future. And I got a fun Gladiator 2 spoiler video coming up next. Don't miss it.